Think Forward. Think Research Channel. The opinions expressed in the following program are strictly those of the speakers. They do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. From the National Science Foundation, where discoveries begin, this is Frontier, discussions of today's most exciting research subjects by distinguished scientists and engineers working at the frontiers of knowledge. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm fairly new to the LTER network, but um, I've been doing kind of trying to integrate ecology and economics uh, for a number of years. And the work that I'm going to talk about is actually joint work with a number of ecologists uh, and others uh, at Minnesota and uh, most primarily at, at Cedar Creek. So I'm going to start with just a few general comments about the energy problem. <laughs> uh, we, uh, this was actually from a few years ago, but, uh, but uh, it, it's certainly still true. The primary problem is you know, we, we are in a growing uh, world economy, population growth, but even, uh, and I think one of the slides earlier today showed that uh, energy use is growing faster than population. Currently fossil fuels supply 80% plus of world energy demand. And so the, the question that, that faces us is how are we going to have a, an environmentally sustainable, economically sustainable uh, energy supply in the future? Uh, and certainly there are problems with fossil fuel that are well known, climate change, carbon emissions, other environmental impacts, energy security issues, uh, supply availability. Uh, the U.S. has had a declining uh, oil production since the 1970s. But when I first started in this field, energy supply was, uh, was probably paramount, but I, I think if you, you know, look more broadly at the uh, fossil fuels, even with finite supplies, we certainly have enough coal to do long-term ecological damage. And so we really need to be thinking about how, even well before supply availability kicks in, we need to be thinking about alternative supplies. Um, there was a very nice quote uh, recently uh, in science. They had a very nice section on, uh, on energy and, and uh, featured a number of renewable energy sources. Um, this quote, I think, uh, captures it all. Sustainable carbon neutral energy is the most important scientific challenge we face today. So desperately seeking alternatives to fossil fuels. Uh, to be an attractive alternative to fossil fuel, to replace that 80% base load of fossil fuels, we need to be, uh, uh, alternative needs to be producible in large quantities. It needs to be environmentally, environmentally benign, sustainable, and it needs to be economically cost competitive. So are biofuels the answer? Well, if I, if I read the, uh, especially in the Midwest, if I, if I follow the advertising, it certainly appears to be so. Here's just a number of things that have uh, been splashed around uh, recently. But let's think seriously about biofuels as an alternative. Um, and certainly one can say biofuels are not the answer, the only answer. Most people who look at this issue think about a multitude of, of answers that are going to have uh, to replace the 80% of fossil fuels. Certainly biofuels can play a role in these, but the kind of role that they play um, depends upon how they're grown and into what system and what are the ecological impacts. And this is a, this is a place where I think the LTER system fits in very well and certainly the, the new thrust of focusing on joint uh, ecological, uh, human, you know, sort of social ecological systems. Uh, we're thinking about uh, energy, which clearly has a, uh, importance to humans, but that fits into an ecological context. And much of the work uh, that David Tillman and others have done at uh, Cedar Creek LTER um, has a lot to say about, uh, about this issue of biofuels as an alternative. What I really want to do is, is two things. One is look at first generation biofuels, uh, sometimes called food based biofuels, because this is really building off the existing agricultural system. So corn grain ethanol and soy biodiesel. 
And then second generation biofuels, uh, things which aren't commercially available right now, but we hope to have in the, in the near future, so cellulosic uh, biofuels. And in particular, I'm going to talk about some work that uh, was done at the LTER, which is directly relevant uh, to this next generation of biofuels. So first, the uh, first generation. Um, so th what I'm going to talk about is based on a, a paper that came out in uh, Proceedings National Academy of Sciences last summer. Uh, what we were trying to do in this paper was to do a, a full assessment of ethanol from corn versus gasoline, its, its sort of conventional fuel counterpart, and soy biodiesel versus diesel. Um, again, looking at it in terms of three dimensions. What's the energy supply? What's the environmental impact? And what are the costs of production? Just a little bit of background in terms of sort of where we are in the ethanol uh, world. You can see, I guess this is another hockey stick. We're, we're, we're ramping up rapidly the uh, amount of ethanol production. Uh, uh, calls for even faster or greater increases in the future. This is just to uh, 2006. To put this into context, uh, in the last year, the amount of corn going into ethanol has passed the amount of corn being exported from the country. So we're actually talking about a fairly substantial amount of the agricultural sector being devoted to fuel production now. So, but one of the first questions that comes up with biofuels, and in particular it's been uh, an issue with corn ethanol, is is it actually an energy source or is it an energy sink? In other words, does it actually produce energy or, or does it take more energy to produce than uh, than you get from the end process. So in order to analyze that, we looked at the net energy balance, which is just the energy output minus all of the energy inputs that you had to uh, have to create the fuel. And if there's a positive net energy balance, it means that you're getting more out than you needed to put energy in to create it. So in order to do that, uh, you, one would look at a life cycle assessment. That's what we did of all the energy inputs, so the energy to grow the crops, so the fertilizer, the uh, energy to make the farm equipment and so forth, the energy to convert the crops, uh, so the distilling process in, from corn into ethanol, um, as well as the energy for transportation and so on. And then look at, at the, uh, all of the energy output, so the content of fuel itself, but also what are called co-products, because there's a number of products that are made in addition to just the ethanol. This busy looking diagram uh, actually summarizes then kind of summarizes all of the inputs and all of the energy outputs from both uh, corn ethanol and soy biodiesel. Um, we do it two different ways. So one is that the left hand side is, uh, is looking at with the co-products uh, involved. The right hand side is just looking at the fuel itself. So it's kind of stripping away the, the co-products. What you can see is that uh, the, the output exceeds the input, but not by a great deal, especially in the case of, of ethanol. Um, what you can get at the bottom of it, the, the net energy balance ratio uh, tells you kind of the, the ratio of output of energy to input. So 1.25 uh, number means you get 25% more energy out than you, get, than you get in. So it is positive, it's a source, but it is not uh, a large source. Uh, for context, um, uh, instead of a 1.25 ratio, if you were thinking about, I saw uh, uh, ethanol from uh, sugar cane, more like a 10 to 1 ratio instead of a 1.25 to 1 uh, ratio. How much do they supply? Um, so currently, well this was actually not currently, this was, this was 2005 and that number has increased since then. Uh, Roughly one-seventh of the supply was going into ethanol. It produced 1.7% uh, of U.S. gasoline supply on an energy uh, basis. Uh, soy biodiesel, even less of the diesel market. How much could they supply? This was actually fairly sobering, and, and this is a, um, every once in a while in, a, in your career, you, get, uh, you, get, you, you create a fact which seems to out, uh, outlive you or go beyond, well beyond you. And so, we did a calculation where we, we said, suppose we put all of the corn supply and all the soybean uh, supply into biofuel production. How much of the gasoline could we displace? How much of the diesel could we displace? So putting all the corn in the country into um, ethanol production, you'd, you'd get 12% you'd get roughly of the, uh, of the gasoline supply. It's not uh, nothing, but it's also not an answer to the energy problem. Um, 
that's in terms of gross. In terms of net, you know, going back to thinking about subtracting all the energy that you had to had to use to make it, uh, it's 2.4 percent of ethanol is 2.4 percent of gasoline, and uh, biodiesel is about 3 percent of diesel supply. Well, it may not have that much of an impact in energy markets, but it certainly had an impact uh, on corn prices. This is just a chart of recent uh, corn prices. So if you want to talk about the feedbacks between uh, multiple systems, uh, here's a good example. Um, there has been a large increase in demand, primarily from ethanol. It's currently about five, uh, capacity is about five billion gallons, slated to go up uh, just with plants that are currently under construction to almost double to nine billion. Corn prices in January 2007 topped $4 a bushel, and that's up from around $2 a bushel in early 2006. So this has had, a, this has had an impact. Let's talk about the environmental impacts. Um, and at first glance, and certainly the, the kind of popular uh, press or the um, advertising would, would make us believe that it's environmentally friendly. And is this correct? Well, this really, really depends upon how one produces the biofuels. And this is where you know, the, the close coordination between uh, the systems engineers and the ecologists and the social scientists is, is, is really needed. Um, in terms of the current generation biofuels, and this story will change when I get to the second generation, but in terms of the first generation biofuels, we're building off an existing uh, agricultural system which uses a, a large number of, of inputs. So this is uh, on the left hand side is fertilizer inputs per unit of useful energy. And on the right hand side is uh, pesticides inputs per unit of useful energy. The, the gold there is uh, corn. Uh, so you can see you're, 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 you're having to put on a lot of fertilizer, a lot of pesticide per unit of useful energy that you're getting out. For soybean it's, it's much less. In terms of greenhouse gas emissions per unit of, of energy, what we've done here is match them up directly with the uh, conventional fuel counterpart, so corn, grain, ethanol versus gasoline on the left, and soybean, biodiesel versus uh, biodiesel on the right. You can see that corn, grain, ethanol is fairly close to gasoline, actually. And you get some savings, but it's not, it's not that much. But the, the savings on uh, soybean, biodiesel, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, is far, far higher. If, if there's a positive net energy balance, you would think that the renewable fuel uh, would clearly have a greenhouse gas advantage because you're growing the crops, it's sequestering the carbon as the, the plant grows. Even if you burn it, it would seem like it would be carbon uh, neutral, at least on that part, versus uh, fossil fuel, which is clearly not uh, carbon neutral. But there are other things that are going on here. First of all, you are using a lot of fossil fuel energy to create the ethanol or the soybean biodiesels we went through before. And then secondly, there are other greenhouse gases at play here. The N2O and methane emissions from uh, crop production, N2O in particular, has a lot greater greenhouse gas warming on a gram per gram basis than, than CO2. Um, and so when you sum all of this up, basically what you get is that ethanol has 88% of the contribution of gasoline. So you're getting a 12% savings uh, with ethanol versus gasoline. But that's not the kind of large savings that one would expect or hope from a renewable fuel. And then finally, are they cost competitive? Um, neither was cost competitive in 2005. Um, they, uh, here are the sort of statistics comparing sort of what the production costs were for ethanol versus wholesale prices for gasoline. Fairly close uh, here. Uh, recent trends have not been that favorable. In 2006, things were quite good for the ethanol industry in particular, but uh, lower fuel prices of, of late and higher corn prices um, uh, make it kind of less competitive. Are they profitable? That's a different question. Um, there are currently large subsidies. And in 2006, the ethanol producers were making very large profits, at least in our part of the world. Um, there's 20 cents uh, per energy equivalent liter for ethanol. And remember, the production costs were on the order of, of, of 40 to 50 cents. So this is a, this is a fairly large subsidy. Biodiesel, 29 cents. There are also kind of indirect subsidies with mandates for ethanol fuels. Um, and for, uh, for biodiesel, uh, and for crop subsidies. So in summary, corn ethanol, soy biodiesel can certainly add something, but they will make a small portion of the fuel supply. There is direct competition with food supply. Um, 
in terms of public policy, we should think about subsidizing environmentally friendly biofuels, environmentally friendly renewable fuels. It's not clear that ethanol fits that category, at least from corn. Um, soybean biodiesel, perhaps a bit better case there. But it clearly indicates that we should be looking beyond the first generation and thinking about a second generation of biofuels. So there's a number of potential candidates. Uh, people have talked about, even the president talked about switchgrass in the State of the Union. Uh, we have wheat straw, poplar, corn stalks, a number of agricultural uh, wastes and uh, other uh, types of uh, biomass that could be grown uh, for uh, feedstock for biofuels. Um, and I want to report on a recent paper uh, by David Tillman and co-authors from, from Cedar Creek uh, looking at quote, carbon negative biofuels. Uh, so not just a slight carbon savings from current, but actually using the fuels and, and storing carbon rather than releasing carbon. This was recently uh, published in Science. Um, this is work that directly comes out of the Cedar Creek LTER, the biodiversity experiment at Cedar Creek. And what has been shown over the years at Cedar Creek, a number of you have seen uh, similar slides. This was not interpreted in terms of how more diversity in a plot of, of, of land, uh, in the Cedar Creek plots, gives you greater biomass, which then gets translated into greater uh, productivity uh, in terms of energy. So on the vertical axis, instead of just biomass, it's, it's, a, it's a biomass energy production. So the um, uh, gigajoules per, per hectare. What also has been shown, and this, this relates to the long-term uh, ecological uh, research that's going on here, is over years that, that effect of increase in diversity on productivity has actually increased. So the lines here show the ratio. The top dark line is, the, uh, is how much greater productivity you have with 16 species in a plot versus one species and then 16 versus 2, and, and so on. And as you can see, these increased productivity, that, that signature has actually grown in strength uh, over the years. In terms of kind of the, the um, energy input-output kind of analysis that, uh, that we did before, uh, what this graph shows is the comparison between sort of this, this, excuse me, the second generation biofuels versus the first generation biofuels. So the first two um, graphs here are, are basically the, uh, the ones I showed before in terms of corn ethanol and soybean biodiesel. Um, the, the three on the right are different ways to run an energy system off of a diverse, uh, off of the prairie grass, uh, uh, diverse prairie grasses as, as, as a feedstock. Um, so one could directly convert this to electricity, put it through you know, some type of uh, 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 burning it in a power plant or uh, creating ethanol, using this as a feedstock to create cellulosic ethanol, or finally uh, uh, a synfuel production. The thing to note, or that, that, I, that was striking for us, is that if you just talk about energy created off of a unit of land, corn, corn wins. I mean, the, the, the top, you know, if you just looked at the energy that comes off of a hectare of land, the corn ethanol wins. But if you look at the net, Right, which is how much you produce minus how much you had to take energy to produce it, then corn ethanol is no longer a winner. And it's really the net that society cares about. It's not just how much you know, did we get off, but how much did you get off minus how much you had to put in. Um, so if we look at the net energy per hectare um, on those same five uh, alternatives that I showed in the, on the previous one, you can actually see that the uh, the, the the second generation of the prairie grasses, even though gross they don't admit they don't generate as much, but in terms of the net energy created, they are in fact higher than the corn ethanol off of, of land. And one of the things that um, uh, I should note here is that, in some sense, this comparison is stacked against the uh, uh, the prairie grasses because those are grown at Cedar Creek, which is very low quality land. Those of you who've been to Cedar Creek know this. It's very low quality agricultural land, uh, and the, the corn returns are from very high, high quality fertile uh, agricultural lands. Two thirds of prairie grasses are actually below ground, and that has an important part of the story for thinking about carbon. So these graphs here show what the carbon uh, storage 
uh, is with the different uh, plots. And again, you get greater carbon storage with uh, greater diversity. So if you combine that story about greater uh, carbon storage uh, along with the energy production, if you look at the life cycle of the, of the uh, production, you get uh, much greater greenhouse gas reductions from biomass energy uh, than you do from these sort of first generation corn or, or soybeans. In terms of the nutrient input, similar story. So on the left hand side, the nutrient inputs uh, per hectare per year for corn and on the right hand side for the low intensity, high diversity uh, prairie bio biofuels. If you're looking at the energy, you know, so the, the, the inputs per unit of useful output, uh, it's very negligible for uh, the prairie grasses, and we already showed uh, it was fairly high for the current uh, generation of biofuels. Some of the benefits that you get from thinking about uh, perennials and diverse systems as opposed to an annual and a, and a monoculture, there's reduced, first of all, reduced competition with uh, food production. This can be done on, on land which is not prime farmland. And if you think carefully about how you do it, it can be made consistent with a number of other environmental values. So thinking about habitat, for example, if you, if you cropped uh, CRP land once in the fall, uh, perhaps mimicking uh, prairie fires, but do it after bird fledging season. That, so there are a number of ways to think about how to actually get some useful product for society in a way which is still um, consistent with environmental values of the land. Uh, when this is put on land which is, quote, degraded, it actually stores more carbon in the soil, it builds up the carbon, so this can actually be a carbon negative fuel over its uh, life cycle. And it's low input and therefore low export of nutrients, uh, pesticides, uh, N, and, uh, and phosphorus, and so forth. And you can get more net energy gain per hectare than the food-based biofuels, as we showed. There are some open questions here. One, uh, and this is something we're working on now, is it cost competitive? Um, partly this is a, a difficult question to answer. The first generation biofuels are commercially available right now and we can ask, you know, we can get evidence about what the cost of production are. The second generation, uh, we need to think about what the technology for turning the cellulosic biomass into, into fuels and that presents significant challenges and there aren't currently commercial uh, plants that give us data, so some of this is guesswork. Um, on the other hand, if you wanted to go with electricity production rather than liquid fuel production, this, these are things that can be done currently with existing technology. So in conclusion, certainly the current generation of biofuels can meet some portion, but it's a very small portion of at least the, the uh, replacement of gasoline and, and diesel, and it tends to do so at pretty high environmental cost. The next generation of biofuels uh, could do a lot better on, on both of those scores. And just to leave you with a final thought, um, we've been talking here a lot about uh, integration of human systems and ecological systems, and, and certainly in agriculture that's, that's been true uh, for long periods of time. So agriculturalists are in fact the de facto managers of many of the most productive lands on earth. Sustainable agriculture rec will require that society appropriately reward ranchers, farmers, and other agriculturalists for the production of both food, I'd add fuel, this was written before we really started working on the fuel, but food, fuel, and ecosystem services. We really need to think about the integration of the range of things that we wish to receive uh, uh, from natural systems or, or our interaction with natural systems. And I just need to thank a few people, including LTER, but uh, the Initiative for Renewable Energy and the Environment at Minnesota, and uh, the, the first set are co-authors on these papers and uh, a number of other people who have helped on this project. Thank you very much. Hey, Dave. Hey, Joe. Great to see you, man. It's Tommy and Dickie Smothers time. So let's jump right into it, Dave. Right. What do we got planned here for tonight? We're talking First about electric all, cars, hybrid electric cars. This is all about science, and it's about a story that really goes back, Charlie, 
over 200 years. Older than I am. Older huh? than you are. Older than dirt, in fact. Yes. Oh, great. Okay. Back when dirt the was a puppy. Story, the real story here isn't just solar cars. Yes, you and your puppies. Is, isn't just solar cars and isn't just electric cars. It's all about the search for the ultimate energy storage. And the search began 200 years ago in, in 1800. 1800. Believe it or not, when the first battery was invented I believe it. by a gentleman named Alessandro Volta. The first guy yeah. who had a revolting electricity revolting joke to tell. Right. Yeah. That's right. Okay. Alessandro was actually an Italian, I believe he was a physics teacher, a high school physics teacher. Physics, yeah, physics teacher in mm -hmm. 1800. My favorite topic. Yeah, they actually did have physics in, in, in 1800. And his experiments with his high school class, see what you can do here, actually invented the battery that we know today. Actually, it wasn't rechargeable. That didn't happen until about 50 years later when Gaston Planté, a Frenchman, okay, Café Scientifique, it fits, right? A Frenchman developed the rechargeable electric battery. Mm. And that is the battery that has powered our way of life here in the 21st century. How do you mean, Dave? Mm. Powered our, I thought we had gasoline cars all over the Every place. Every gasoline car requires a rechargeable battery. Today's gasoline cars are using more and more electrical energy. And weren't there a lot of electric cars around the 1890s or something before we even had gasoline cars? Sure, sure. At one point, there were more electric cars in the United States than any other form of car. There were, there were gasoline cars. There were steam cars, by the way. But there were more electric cars until about 1920. And that's when the electric starter motor was invented. And that's when Henry Ford came out with the Model T. And so the electric starter motor was the one that put the death to the electric well, cars. There's one other element to this, Charlie. Henry Ford actually started an electric car company before he started building the Model T. Oh. And he and his good buddy, Thomas Edison. No. Yeah, really. No, it's a good thing. You never up? heard this story? Like Dave and Charlie? Yeah, like Dave and Charlie, right. Yeah. They were really good pals. They used to go camping together. Uh -huh. And Thomas Edison was working on his brand new battery back then, because mm -hmm. everything had been lead batteries. And lead batteries were terrible batteries back in those days. They would last maybe a couple of thousand miles. And then you'd have to take this big jar and dump it out and all the guck and stuff. It was a long story. Ooh, pretty ugly. It was, it was a mess. But Thomas Edison was working on this thing called the Edison cell, which was a nickel iron battery. And it was going to revolutionize the batteries. And Henry Ford was going to build the electric car to use Thomas Edison's nickel iron cell. Now we're talking back around 1910 or thereabouts. It's almost before my time. This is a yeah. blitzkrieg tour yeah. through yeah. history yeah. here. And they actually, you know, they kept waiting and waiting and waiting for, Henry, for, uh, for Thomas to get it right. And the next thing you know, the investors pulled the plug on the whole thing. They couldn't uh, wait uh, anymore. Uh. And this, in a way, it tells us a little bit about the story of the battery. We've been working on battery development since 1800. And it has come along almost like geologic time, until hmm. about the last 10 minutes ago. <laughs> then things started to really pick up, right? A pick up. I like that. <laughs> hey, well, there's no batteries in my solar-powered electric junior solar sprint race car over there, wherever it went to. Is that, uh, is that why are we focusing all this energy on, so to speak, on batteries? After all, we've got these nice cars out there. They have electric motors. They have controllers. They have an accelerator pedal and all that. Who, why, why worry about batteries so much, Dave? because the search, the search for energy storage is all about finding an alternative in the post-petroleum age. We've got two things happening that we all have to be very, very concerned about. People who care about the future, people who care about our children, people who care about our Earth, have to know that there's two very important things happening in the world today. Ah, uh, what's that? One of them is the peak oil situation, and one of them is the peak carbon situation. In other words, we're putting a lot of carbon into the air that we never had there before, and the planet is starting to get very, very warm. Oh, I know about this. this is a famous this. hockey stick right? graph. This is your hockey stick graph. See the red area here? These are temperatures. This is the year 1000, 1200, 1400, That's 1600, when you were born, right there, 1800 right there. when the battery was invented. Uh -huh. Okay, and all of a sudden, as we approach the year 2000, the industrial age, look at that spike. That's the hockey puck. That's the hockey that stick. It goes up. You're the okay. puck. Okay. There's the, there. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Okay. And all of a sudden, carbon is going off the charts, and our climate is starting to heat up. And a it lot doesn't of it, show any plus right. sign of stopping right. unless we do something about it, which a is A lot of it about. is because we're using carbon-based fuels, fossil fuels, Boo. especially petroleum. Ugh. But look what's happening over here at the same time. Uh -huh. Let's look at there. the same time frame. I don't know if you can all see the details here. Yeah, this These is the year blue. 2000 here. Okay. That's the year 2000 Here's there. a 2000 here, and something very interesting is happening right on this line here. These vertical bars here are all the new oil discoveries from 1930 forward. And I want to thank, sure. by the way, Congressman um, Bartlett, Roscoe Bartlett, Roscoe Bartlett provided this chart to, uh, for us, from, also from the Carbon Institute. 
But the point being that all of these oil discoveries started to taper off around 1970 or so. And you can see how these, these discoveries are going smaller and smaller and smaller. This black line you see here is the rising demand for oil. So as, as this chart is falling off upside down, you're seeing that basically the oil is sinking, okay? The, what's happening here is we are sinking on discoveries. This, this show is sinking, but yeah. the... Uh, <laughs> The, uh, my slip is showing, or my show is slipping, one or the other. What we're seeing here is a demand, demand for oil is skyrocketing. We're not running out of oil, but what's happening is the demand is exceeding the rate of new discoveries, so we are having a crunch. And the crunch is going to get worse and worse right here in the United States, where we consume a quarter of the world's oil supply. Mm. Obviously, as China starts to build more and more cars for their citizens, and India starts to sell more cars to their citizens, we can't keep consuming a quarter of the world's oil supply because we only have 3% of the reserves. We got a problem here, ladies and gentlemen. So this is the peak oil thing up there, is that right? There's Dave? peak oil, okay. We got consumption going up, discovery going down. So eventually discovery. our amount that's left for us to consume may be going down. And we think we've hit the peak right here around the year 2000, about the same time that we started to see this very, very high carbon increase in the atmosphere. We're somewhere, what about? 500 parts per million? Well, we're at 380 up. parts per million now, but they predict unless we change our wicked ways, it'll go up to 500 exactly. parts per million. So we, so we have a little time. Right? Push back. We have a little time to do this. And how does the electric car help push back on all this petroleum peak okay. oil stuff and the hockey puck stuff? Here's the story about electricity. Electric motors are very, very efficient. That's no. what makes us do it. How efficient are they, Dave? Electric motors are somewhere between five and six times more efficient than an internal combustion engine. Now, why is that? For several reasons. Not only is the electric motor inherently higher efficiency because of the electromagnetic fields that surround it, but also, also because the electric motor doesn't idle like a gasoline car does. Right. And That's one. when you go down a hill, the electric motor becomes a generator. We have a thing called regenerative braking and that motor becomes a generator. It's the same design in reverse, and we generate energy and put it back in the battery. So all of that adds to the efficiency of the car, and that is why hybrids work so well when we blend those two things. Great, two good reasons. Mm -hmm. In fact, some of our cars out front had that same regenerative braking idea, so they can get back some of the power of the moving car, the kinetic or moving energy, and save it as stored energy. But there's another very good reason, Charlie, and you know, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, all right? Don't tell me, Dave. Let's talk about electricity as the lucre of the what's a good word for lucre a better word than that it's the money. it's the money it's the money of the energy world okay because we can make electricity that's i knew there was a better word than that yeah it's a big right? word for right. me right. Lucre. Yes, right. wow. i head. knew we come up with something electricity can be made from so many different things okay we got solar solar nuclear coal geothermal wind. hydro wind. wind all the hot air renewable up energy okay Electric cars can use electric energy directly. It's the only technology that can actually do that. So we could take the solar and wind electricity, pump it right into these batteries, and drive our cars around town with zero pollution coming and out. And we do that. We have members right here in Washington, D.C. Brian Murtha, the fellow with the RAV4, we lives in a solar house in suburban Maryland and uses some of the solar panel energy to recharge his electric car. So that's, that's a very doable thing. And. Uh, that's one of the reasons that we like electricity because we, can, we have a tremendous amount of other sources of electricity right here in the good old US of A, all throughout the North American and the South American continent. We've got lots of energy things and we can blend these things together. And not only that, but if we're talking about plug-in hybrid vehicles, remember those? Ah, how does that work? You got a hybrid car, I've heard about that. It's got right. electricity and gasoline to make it go, like the Toyota Prius. Okay. And then you've got an electric car like yours or my Chevy S10, all electric, all batteries, no gasoline. What's a plug-in hybrid electric? Okay, now we take a bigger battery than the one that's in today's hybrids. So now, a instead of driving the car for maybe a few miles on all electric, we raise the amount of mileage we can go. We can go 20, 30, 40, maybe up to 60 miles on all electric range before the gasoline motor cuts in. Uh -huh. What that does means, that do? That means I could drive to work and back probably or go to the store you and got buy it, my bro. potato chips, which I need so much, Absolutely. and then come home all electric mode, no pollution, get my solar and wind or other kind of power. To, but then when I want to go on a long trip to see grandma in West Virginia. You've got 600 miles range. On a okay. hybrid but electric. Now, but now, efficiency vehicle. instead of getting 45 or 50 miles per gallon in today's hybrids, we've now doubled the, doubled the fuel efficiency by using all that electricity because it's so much more efficient. So instead of 50, we're talking about 100 or 150 miles per gallon 
in a, in a, in a sedan and up to uh, 75 miles per gallon or more in a full-sized SUV. That's yes, it's really tricky, doable folks. with electricity. Pretty tricky. Watch yeah. it. No time will his hands leave his wrist. Mm -hmm. Nothing up his sleeve. He's going to get 150 miles per gallon right up here in the stage in okay. front of you tonight. Let me show you another trick now. Okay. Yeah? okay. We talked. Mary was talking about ethanol and biofuels. These are great things. We we want them all. We need all those things, ladies and gentlemen. Before we're going to have, we're going to be able to do anything about our terrible peak oil gap that's, that's that's coming down upon us in terrible ways in the next 15 to 20 years. We've got to find a solution. We've got 200 million cars and light trucks on the road. They turn over about every 10 years. So it's going to take decades to have any impact whatsoever if we start to sell all electric cars or plug-in hybrid cars or ethanol cars now. It's going to take decades before we can deal with a problem that's coming down on our heads in less than two decades. So if we, we want to have a, a better world for all these kids who are here tonight, not just solar electric junior solar sprints to race around, but in these plug-in hybrid electric cars would be one good technology. Absolutely. So we're on the cutting edge. All of you among us that, are, that were interested enough to come here tonight are all on the cutting edge. It's the cutting edge where science, technology, politics, and early adopters all meet. There's just so much involved in this thing. It's hard, it's hard to say. It all started with, a ve with some vehicles okay, on the moon, okay? It was back in the 1970s. We had the NASA Lunar Rover, which was the very first electric car, the modern electric car of all time. It was built by a, a company, a little company that was a subsidiary to the Boeing Corporation. Maserati. No. 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 Try again. Uh, General Motors? It was General Motors. <laughs> <laughs> General Motors built the Lunar Rover on the hill, right? Hey. General Motors made these things. This was the key to the successful, uh, the successful Apollo lunar missions. They couldn't pick up the lunar rocks and bring them back to the shuttle. They couldn't explore the moon without an electric car. Gasoline cars don't do very well on the moon. This is an all-electric so car? It's an all-electric car. Why couldn't they have a gasoline car up there, Dave? Well, there's just not much air for the internal combustion oh, engine. Suck okay? in and That's burn a all the fuel. Right. I get it. Uh, so they had to basically reinvent the car. So and here's was, a reinvention. Yeah. What's this one, Dave? Here is the Mars Lunar Rover, another Ooh. beautiful example of what we can do with electric technology if we really have a mind to do it. Solar panels up here on the top. We wouldn't have been on batteries. Mars if it hadn't been for that. Again, electricity is the role, is the key. So, so, um, so then, some of our junior solar sprint kids out here might be making the next Martian rover with solar power panels. It could be. You know, this rover has been up there on Mars running around for the longest time. They thought it was going to die after a while, but it just keeps on keeping on and keeping like the Ever Ready Bunny, and it's not dead yet. Bye, guys. Well, that's the hope, okay? And the whole point is to start a new generation of thinkers and doers in this country that will use the lessons of science and apply them in new ways. Thinkers. Thinkers, doers. This is what we did for the space program, ladies and gentlemen. Back in the 1970s, we didn't know how to put a man or a woman on the moon. We didn't know how to put a car on the moon. Didn't have the computers. We had to invent it as we went along, OK? There was no existing science to do the things that we imagined that we could do. But we imagined our way up there, and we made it happen, because that is the great American experience. But for plug-in hybrid electric cars, we've already got all the technology. We don't have to invent anything. But there's a problem. We? There's another problem here, oh. Chief. OK. It's about economics. OK, we talk hmm. about science. We've got the wonderful science. We've got great batteries now. That's money, right? Right. Money. It Luker. all comes down to money. We build cars in this country. We build cars. Luker, right. And they all operate on one very essential fuel. Let's not always see the same hands, class. How do these car companies work? What are they in business for? Ah, uh, money, honey. Money, of course, money, well, honey. There's nothing wrong with money. There's I nothing mean, wrong with money. Money's a good thing to have. Money. I make money. That's so. right. Lots of people work for the car companies and earn lots of money. So we I don't have earn a very money. I just get the money. We have a very w important way of life in this country. Okay, you just so uh, thinkers. You were thinking about. So thinkers. here's the thing. We've got to take cars. We've got to find ways to make electric cars not only make money for consumers. Yes. which they will save money but they've got to make money for the car companies otherwise they're out of business well they're not going to make much money off of me with my electric truck because i get electricity at 70 cents a gallon and that's what scares them bro oh they don't they like don't that? they don't like that well the electric right. uh, utility companies right. would like to sell more electricity they'd make more money that way and the gasoline people can go shove it where the sun doesn't shine <laughs> i mean you know under the ground know, this is a family show meant. okay I'm, I'm sorry um, that's cover your ears. Cover your ears, Charlie. Oh, really? um, uh, NSF disclaimer. <laughs> <laughs> the opinions expressed here tonight it's do not, not necessarily cameras. reflect. Yeah, uh, right. But in any event, we know that we can do this thing, and we know we can find ways so the automobile company, it's a win-win situation, okay? 
we can win for our country, we can win for the environment, we can win for peak oil, we can win for our children. And we don't have to import all this oil from right. overseas. We don't have to send our money over to people who are not interested in the welfare of some people that's, in this that's country. That's true. They keep all that money home, the right. American electrons. But the truth is, we don't have any choice, okay? Because all of this is coming down on us, regardless of whether we do something or not. Car companies today are withering on the vines. We've got to find new technologies to appeal to consumers that helps them meet the challenges of tomorrow. I would like to help out Ford. I don't want them okay. to lose $12 billion again. They could go in the hole at that rate. <laughs> could be a problem. Could be a problem, bro. So they'd better think better. Now, let me ask you this, Dave. We were thinking about thinkers. Do we have any thinkers here tonight? Like, who's this guy over here with the beer in front of him? Did I ever tell you about my Uncle Albert? He'd rather have a bottle in front of yeah, him than yeah. a frontal lobotomy. Uncle right? Albert was a, was a fascinating, fascinating guy, okay? Uncle Albert was a great thinker, and he was a believer that, that science was a little bit like religion. No. It, was, it, was the, it was something about the joy of discovery and of feeling the sense of being able to do something important with your life that solved people's problems. Gosh. That's really what it was all about. What a nice guy. Right. All Did he have us, an electric car? He had no electric car, but uh -huh. he had... He had the he had the right. You know that actually, his hair looks like he stuck his finger in an electric socket. He does. Now, one of the I'm interesting things, wondering. one of the th interesting things that Uncle Albert was trying to do was trying to blend the idea of gravity and electromagnetism. Did you know that? No. Yeah, really. The whole there was he was it was the unified theory. We call it today quantum mechanics. Ooh, quantum mechanics. I want to get into the, de the details of quantum mechanics, but that's what he came up with. And it was a whole lot, one of the things he was trying to figure out. Remember, electromagnetism is what moves electric cars. Is there a relationship between gravity and electromagnetism? You bet. Somewhere in physics there is, and somewhere we're going to find it and make better cars as a She's result gonna of that. She's going to find out what it is over there. I You're know. going to figure it out? She's the one. One of you. One of you will figure Dave it out. Dave will be your Vanna White, and you can be right. the brains of the operation. Right. And we will be, we will be your quantum mechanics. Hey, now how about auto mechanics? Are auto mechanics going to have any jobs when they, all these you electric bet. motors, you hey, know, electric motors don't break down and blow each other up? There are hundreds of thousands of jobs for those of you that like to work with your hands, like to solve problems, like to work on technical challenges. People in the automotive industry who work on advanced cars that work with the electronics, the computers, and all of the onboard electrical uh, mal glitches that occur nowadays, are earning big, big bucks. So it could be fun for In them. my day, my, my, my dad didn't want me, he wanted me to go to college and be a physicist or a lawyer like you, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But if I had become an auto mechanic like I wanted to, I'd be earning $100,000 or more today. Not bad. Right? Right? Anybody here need a job? Yeah, right. And that's, so you can see the world is, is turning topsy-turvy. Dark cars is hiring. The challenges are there. The, the science is there. The math is there. The opportunities are there. Hmm. Now, my electric motor in my car out front it's not going to have an explosion going on inside it like an internal combustion engine. How long is that motor going to last before it wears itself out? Well, this is an interesting thing. Okay, now, your electric motor is good for about 300,000 miles. Mm. Okay? I they like don't that. wear out. They're Why just not? incredible. It's one moving part. Okay? Ah, There's no so pistons going up and down. And also, if you're driving a hybrid car, and this is, again, what the automobile companies don't really like. Is there any automobile people here? I hope they're not offending anybody. They'll um, get us later, I'm yeah, sure. They'll get us later, right? Um, you see, to the extent that you're driving on electricity and not on the internal combustion engine, you're not wearing those pistons out as quickly. and You're not using the filters and belts and, and oil and all those other things that they make lots of money. You know how it is when you buy a, a, you buy a printer, you're right? You go down to the store, they have a printer on sale for $69.95. Cheap. And then the cartridges are what? 35 bucks. 35 bucks every two weeks. Mm, that'll right. get you. That's the way the car business works, okay? They sell you the car cheap. They'll finance it cheap. But then, then you got to bring it back for the tune-ups and the oil changes and the belts and the filters and the onboard computers and the sensors. And boy, have they got you. Well, now, wait a second. Right. Electric cars have maintenance, too. I mean, you've got those batteries. Don't they wear out and go bad after a while? Sure, sure. Well. And that's part of the challenge. That's on the cutting edge. Now, we know. Brian, how long have your batteries been in your uh, RAV4 electric your nickel car? Metal hydride nickel batteries. metal hydride batteries, which we developed here in the United States using the best scientific methods we know and using taxpayers' dollars from the Department of Energy. What do you think, Brian? Five years old, 64,000 miles, 62 on the original batteries, okay? 
and, and we we've had reports from California where some of the fleets have gotten up to 150,000 miles in that same on the original battery pack. Nickel metal hydride batteries. Now, they're not the best ones. What about these lithium-ion lithium batteries? Lithium-ions are the hot new area because now if we take a lithium-ion battery... Is that a joke? The hot new ones? Hot they new the things, ones yeah. that heat it up? No, they're not uh, too hot. Well, they can get hot, but we're talking here about a battery that is basically half the size and half the weight of a, lith of a nickel metal hydride battery. Ooh, lightweight. But it's cutting edge technology. And there's lots of ways to tailor it for the cars of the future. And we don't know. We don't know exactly how people are going to drive a plug-in hybrid. We don't know exactly um, whether you're going to drive it in the mountains or you're going to drive it into, uh, uh, into a brick wall. Into a brick wall, right, exactly. If, how you're going to drive it, how fast you're going to drive it. If you drive like me, you're Harry Hot Rodder. If yeah. we drive like you, you're like the little old lady from Pasadena. Yeah. Right. Yes, of um, course. Right. The, um, but the, uh, the net result is they can't figure out how fast these batteries are going to wear out. And they don't want to be caught with all these warranty claims. The well, why don't we run factor. some experiments and get some lithium-ion batteries exactly and throw right. them into the car and run it around the block? That's the next step. We need to do demonstration programs with plug-in hybrid vehicles, mm -hmm. cars that will allow you not only to drive on electricity or gasoline, but to use all these alternative fuels that we're talking about, like biodiesel. Yeah, something even better. Ethanol. Laser beams from Mars is Whatever. the next stuff. Yeah. I want to fill up on that. But here's, the cu here's, a, here's a cute trick, okay? We're okay. talking about petroleum. We're talking about the price of petroleum going up to maybe five, six, seven, eight dollars a gallon. It could happen. We're it talking about happen. global warming. We're talking about global warming. Bad news. Let's say we take a well, plug-in hybrid car. Yes. We've got a car that will go maybe 100, 150 miles per gallon on a liquid fuel. Yes. But now let's say we replace 85% of that gasoline with ethanol. Oh, so it's 85% ethanol and 15% right. gasoline. We call that E85. E85, right? ethanol E85. We can get a slightly net positive energy balance, but we still have problems getting enough ethanol across the entire country to serve everybody's needs. So now what we do is we spread it out, we put it into gas stations that plug it in and plug it into our plug-in hybrid vehicles. Mm, so, so what have we done? What have we done to the petroleum? You took a vehicle that could get 100 or 100 miles, miles per gallon. On okay. Liquid fuels. We took, this is a math problem. Okay. Pencils down. Okay. We take 15 percent. What was once 100 percent is now just 15 percent petroleum-based fuel. The rest of it is grown from corn or switchgrass or um, biomass. Now only 15 percent of the liquid fuel in that 100 mile per gallon car is petroleum. And the other 85 percent so is ethanol. How many miles per gallon are we getting on petroleum? Uh, Brazilians. Brazil. Oh, that's a about, whole lot. About 666 miles per gallon oh, that's on petroleum. Smaller than gazillion. we can do it. Okay. okay. Simple okay. math. It's a matter of spreading out our resources, using the technology that we understand, putting people to work on the problem. You, ladies and gentlemen, are among some of the people that may very well be either the early adopters driving these vehicles or working to help maintain them, sell them, promote them, do whatever you can to help make our country safe again. And so your car could look like this. Is that it, Dave? This is the Tesla. Boy, is this a great car. This is the first modern, state-of-the-art electric sports car after the EV1. This is the car they crushed. You see the inductive charger? Who the one the General the Motors car? crushed because they didn't think there was a future. They only built about 1,000 of them. And the people that drove them loved them. I drove it. It's like driving an airplane. It was an incredible car. It was like driving an electric Corvette. Whoosh. Fast. And then neat. they killed him. That drive. And then they killed him. Nuts. So here's the next generation. This is a lithium I this, that was nickel metal hydride. It had a range of about 135 miles. This sports car is hundred thousand dollars. It uses lithium ion batteries. Cheap. Up front, cheap. Hundred thousand dollars. They've just sold out the first run. You couldn't buy one for for hundred thousand dollars now. All the Hollywood guys. Hollywood celebrities have put in their orders. Arnold Schwarzenegger was seen driving in one of these cars. <clears throat> Okay, it's a delightful car, and by the way, it goes zero to sixty in about three and a half seconds. It's faster than a Ferrari. How? Right, which is what you can do with electricity because it's so fast, it's so efficient. How fast is electricity? Anybody know the answer? Raise your hands. Anybody know? Ah, how fast is the speed of light? Did everybody know that That's one? Right. It. Fast as fast as the speed right, of light. There you go. Yeah. Pretty daggone fast. Very it's good. the fastest stuff in the universe. So it is. How come this car doesn't go okay. as fast as the speed of light, Dave? And also, how come the automobile manufacturers can't build a car like this? Why does it take a small Silicon Valley company? called Tesla Motors, and Tesla, of course, was one of the great all-time experimenters of electricity in the United States. How come it took Silicon Valley entrepreneurs to figure out how to do it? Where are the car company engineers and scientists of tomorrow? The inventors are right out here tonight. Right here in this room. Everybody possible. under the yeah. age of 12 yeah. is going yeah. to rule the world. Yeah.
So, uh, you know, Dave, not only did John Clinton bring the terrific uh, MIT solar car here tonight, John, where are you? Say hello to the crowd. We have a number of people from EBA DC, the Electric Vehicle Association, here with us tonight, many of whom have brought their electric cars with, us, with them. They're outside. We also want to thank Dave Duval of Fairfax County, Virginia, who's here tonight. Dave, will you raise your hand? Dave over there is the first driver of a plug-in hybrid vehicle in our area. So if anybody wants to see what a plug-in Prius looks like, Dave is the man to talk to. And Brian Murth is here tonight with his Toyota RAV4 all-electric solar-powered car. He's got solar panels on the roof of his house, which charges up his vehicle. Where are you, Brian? That was one of the cars featured in Who Killed the Electric Car, the famous movie that a lot of... Have, has everybody seen the movie, by the way? Who Killed the Electric Car? Who Killed the Electric Car? If you haven't seen it, rent it from Blockbuster, buy it. It's a great movie. Netflix? Mm -hmm. It'll, you'll get religion just like we have. Now, wait a second. Aren't there some other electric cars out Absolutely. front? Absolutely. Mike Harvey is here tonight. He's outside probably with the, what he with calls his electric cabbie. It's a white Volkswagen Cabriolet. Beautiful car that he converted from a gasoline car to all electric drive. And he drag races it too. And we have one other electric car here tonight. That's my solar powered junior solar sprint electric race car, which I'm gonna hand off to some of my hands-on science kids out here in the front. I see some new kids who haven't had a chance to grab a hold of this. Yeah. Well, the real question is, how did they ever manage to get that MIT solar car in the building through the doorways? Inhaled. That is a mystery that we must ask our team captain, John Clinton. Thank you, John, for all the work that you do and the many members of EBA DC who have volunteered to work their weekends and their rear ends off to put that car back together. We brought it in piece it's by a piece. family show, yeah. Dave. Yes, None of that uh, stuff. Yeah, we're talking ends, politely yeah. here. Okay, good. Okay. We brought in the, the car. In the it was a basket case. MIT had given up on the car. They were moving on to other electric cars. They built this car from the ground up, and they raced it in the Tour de Sol and many other international solar racing events. And they won. And they won. Yeah. And then they gave it to us in, in pieces. In it was literally baskets. Mm -hmm. And our members went up to Cambridge and brought it back and assembled it piece by piece, painstakingly and lovingly, and learned a lot about electric cars in the process. And that's the point. It isn't really rocket science at all. Who else do we okay. need to thank here tonight? We need to thank uh, Barbara, your, wi your, your wife. Barbara has selflessly uh, supported me all these years in my patiently lonely, with lonely quest. Let me tell you, Charlie. she's a saintess. Thank you, Barbara. Also, uh, Mary Hansen, who has been the person who has coordinated this event. Very good. What a wonderful person to work with. Yeah. And the many people here at the National Science Foundation who have supported Cafe Scientifique.